Uh, welcome to this session on the SMART Health IT Project and the SMART App Platform. I'm Josh Mandel. I'm the Chief Architect at Microsoft Healthcare and the Chief Architect for SMART Health IT. Uh, I'm a physician and a software engineer and have been working on making clinical data easier to work with uh, for software developers uh, over the last decade or so, and really excited to get to share with you uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, there's links to this slide deck and more at the URL you see on your screen here, bit.ly slash smartfiretech, and that same link should be available in the Whova chat. Um, so let's dig in. I'm going to try to share as much as I can with you in uh, the next 35 minutes or so and save about 10 minutes at the end for questions. I want to start off just by giving you a sense of some of the motivating factors behind this work uh, and, then, and then really some of our goals. So this is from a report that we commissioned a few years back, working with a number of hospitals and health systems in the US, focused on the places where different applications or, or technologies were deployed in the context of a clinical workflow. So clinician facing apps and tools. Uh, and this was really a representative um, quote that we had from one of the physicians who participated in the interviews, which was that we were using this wonderful population health tool, but we couldn't get the EHR system to interface with it so we had to enter information by hand, and eventually we had to give up because we just couldn't keep up with that software. And that continues to be a really common experience. Um, the effort to bridge different pieces of software together is sometimes more than the value that those individual pieces of software can provide. And that problem is magnified when we think about small or special purpose applications making up a clinical workflow. Uh, so the core focus of the Smart Health IT project in, in one slide is this. On the one hand, we have healthcare apps, which might do one really specific job and do them well. Um, so in the, in the images here, you see an example of a growth chart or an app indicating where a particular patient uh, is experiencing symptoms across the various joints in their body. These apps can be focused and tailored and really make the clinical workflow a lot easier. And on the other side of the slide, you see many different kinds of clinical data systems, whether they're electronic health record systems or care coordination tools uh, or patient portals or health record banks or data warehouses or any of those kinds of electronic systems that can manage clinical data. So in the middle is this smart uh, health IT or the smart API, which focuses on the core goals of making these apps run without having to understand the details of the different clinical systems where they're running. Uh, and in a nutshell, that means support for some kind of user experience integration together with authorization. So those apps can run inside of or tightly um, connected with the systems where they operate. Uh, and so the apps can be given just the controls they need to access the data that they require. And so that there's a single sign on mechanism. So users don't have to sign into every different app that they want to use throughout the course of their day. And of course, critically, these apps need access to a consistent and rich set of clinical data which includes structured clinical data, meds and labs, problems and allergies, and, and all those structured data, as well as unstructured data like clinical notes, which is often where the entire thought process of the care plan tends to live. And so this is what we're really focused on is providing that integration layer. And what it gives us then, if you can buy into a system like this, uh, first of all, is for the users of these applications, for clinicians and patients and researchers and hospital staff, it gives us this property we call substitutability. So the S in SMART stands for substitutable. Um, and we talk about substitutable medical apps because you should be able to use the app that does the best job of managing a growth chart for you. And if a better app comes along in the future, you should be able to switch out the old one and swap in the new one. So users really benefit from this ecosystem where they can have their preferred apps and bring them to bear on their problems. Meanwhile, developers benefit by having one consistent set of open standards that they can target and use for integrating their apps. It means that the barriers for building an app are lower because there are standard libraries in place for getting started. Uh, and it also means that by building an app once, you can integrate it with many different clinical systems. And really critically, uh, this changes the dynamics of what it takes to build an app. Uh, because if you're just building an app that's gonna run in one place, it might be an unreasonable investment to provide a high degree of fit and finish and polish and a smooth user experience. But if you know you can take that app and scale it to a wide population of users, suddenly it becomes worth putting in that effort. And so what that means is that electronic health record systems in this context become kind of a modern app development platform. Uh, it supports, the EHR supports things like user management and workflows and data persistence, all of the core or foundational services that you wouldn't want to have to replicate in every single application. And apps really then can focus on doing those user-facing jobs 
and doing them well. So I want to say a couple of words about uh, adoption as we get started. Uh, and actually, first of all, let me say one of the key drivers of adoption has been a group called the Argonaut Project. I'll tell you a little bit about those, uh, that group and those efforts in the progress of the presentation here. And then the other key driver has been in the United States, the regulatory environment. And I'm not going to get into the details of this slide, but this comes from our national coordinator for health IT in the US, which is an aggressive schedule uh, driving towards consistent adoption of these smart on fire APIs over the course of the next two years, two to three years. Uh, and so there's been really this virtuous cycle between a group of vendors participating in developing the specs and regulators taking the best of what's working. Uh, and that in turn raises the question of how can we refine and improve things? And that'll be a, a theme through today's presentation. You'll hear about some standards that were stabilized a few years ago. And I'll also share with you some of the ongoing work to improve and extend the capabilities of those standards. But let me start off just by telling you about one of the core jobs that the smart app launch specification does. Uh, and this is to say, if you have an app that needs to connect to an EHR, how does that connection get made? And how does it happen in a secure way? And how do we make sure that we only give the app access to the data that it needs? And so we have a couple of, of specifications for what we call an app launch. The first one is what we call our standalone launch. And the key idea here in this use case is we have an app on the left and an EHR on the right, and the workflow starts with the app. And so the best example that I might point to for this standalone launch would be something like the Apple Health app on your iPhone or the Common Health app on your Android phone, where you as an individual patient can open up this app. And then after you've opened the app, you decide to connect the app to one of your electronic health records in a clinical data system somewhere. And what happens is using a standardized uh, OAuth based workflow, the app uh, directs you, redirects in a browser context to your patient portal or to the EHR that you need to sign into. You authenticate or sign into that EHR and can decide to approve access. So you as the user can say, yes, I want to share my data with this app. And if you choose to, then the app gets uh, an access token and information about what you've decided to share, as well as what we call contextual information uh, to know which patient record we're talking about, um, when we embed these apps in other contexts, we can share information um, like which encounter is currently open in an EHR and styling data and so on. And so at the end of step two here, the app has an access token, which it can then use to connect to the Fire API in the EHR and issue data requests. And so this is how we combine an authorization standard together with a clinical data access standard to provide this end-to-end user-facing workflow for what we call the standalone app launch. Now, a slight variation on this, but a very powerful variation, is what we call the EHR app launch. And if you look closely, you'll see that really all we did was to add one extra arrow at the very top of this diagram. But what this means is instead of starting from the app, here you're starting from the EHR. Now, why is this important? Because this is the key for providing clinical applications in the context of a clinician's workflow. So let's say I've got a patient record open in my electronic health record. Uh, I am maybe seeing many patients in a given day or even in a given hour. And so being able to optimize the time that it takes to switch between my EHR and these applications is really important. So if I can embed that app into the EHR, then the EHR can call out to the app and say, hey, growth chart app, it's time for you to launch now. And as the user, I never have to leave the context of my EHR. The app can show up embedded directly inside of my clinical data system. And the rest of this launch specification works exactly the same way as in the standalone launch. So I won't go through the details of, of step 1B and beyond because it's the common basis that we already discussed. But what I would like to do is drill into a couple of these distinctions about exactly what data are shared. Because as the, the spread of health uh, IT data, clinical data, as well as individual personal device and tracking data are driving better decisions in healthcare, we also have to elevate our expectations about privacy and minimizing the, the sharing of data that aren't required for certain use cases. And what I'll show you here is, first of all, what we launched in the first version of the SMART specification a few years ago, uh, and this is still the current version. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing to improve these capabilities. Uh, but first, SMART version one supports scopes that are tied to fire resource types. So if you're building an app that manages a patient's immunization record, for example, you can use these scopes uh, as a way of requesting specific permissions to just the data that you need. And each scope has a few major parts. Uh, the first is what we call an access type or access level. 
And so if I am building an app that is just operating on one patient record at a time, I'm always going to be talking about patient, the patient access type. If I'm building an app that might show data from many patients together, maybe to show a clinician their entire schedule, uh, then we might use what's called this user level access type. So after we define the access type, we say which fire resources we need access to. And so these are just fire resource names. In this case, we're saying we want to access all the immunizations in the current patient record. And then finally, there's a permission, uh, which is generally either read or write. Um, so this scope here expresses the fact that an app needs to read immunizations inside of the context of one patient record. That's maybe the, the sort of simplest example that we could start from. And then you can combine these scopes to express the different requirements that an app has. So a simple app that might just need to read observations as well as patient demographics might use this kind of scope that I've showed here. A more complex app might try to read all different fire resource types associated with a patient record. An electronic prescribing app might try to write uh, new medication orders or medication requests in fire R4 uh, associated with that patient. Or a population health app might, access, might request access to read all the data that its user is allowed to see. So that would be something like user slash startup read. And these resource level scopes have taken us a long way in Smart V1. Uh, they provided the basis for the current regulatory regime in the US and a number of uh, consumer and clinician facing health apps that have deployed. But a common question is, what about fire resource types that are quite broad? Something like patient observation dot read that really gives access to a lot of different kinds of data in FHIR that are modeled as observations. So sure, it might have your vital signs, so you might need that for a growth chart app, but it might also have your lab results and your social history and many other kinds of observations. And it would be nice if there was a finer grained way to express just the, the subset of the observations that you actually need. And so as part of this Argonaut project, an industry consortium this year, working with some of the major electronic health record vendors and technology companies together with uh, HL7, in the standards acceleration framework. And we've been working towards what we call uh, smart scopes V2. And the idea here is to provide finer grained access. And I wanna say this is work in progress. We've got links to this from the slide deck that I'm presenting here. And the goal is to standardize this um, with an initial ballot as soon as May of 2021. Uh, but I wanna give you a preview of what's coming. Um, and first of all, just to say, uh, we have finer grained scopes than the read and write that we started with in V1 so that we can differentiate between the ability to create, read, update, delete, and search for fire resources. And the idea here is this very closely mirrors the uh, interactions defined in the fire specification itself. Um, so that's one kind of granularity. But more importantly is granularity about exactly which resources are being read. And this is really the key. And I'll just give you the, the sort of brief view here. Our focus has been to use an existing syntax, what's called the fire search parameter syntax to make our scopes more expressive. So rather than just saying, I want to read and search for all the observations in a patient, we use the syntax from fire search to say, I just want access to those observations that are in the category of laboratory, or I just want observations that are in the category of vital signs. And that sort of capability allows an individual app to request access to, in theory, anything that you can write a fire search parameter um, to focus down on. Now in practice, FHIR has a lot of different search parameters. Search in FHIR is a very rich capability. Uh, and out the gate, we don't expect every possible search to be supported. Uh, what we're gonna aim to do is identify some key search parameters, which might be things like category or security tags, uh, and try to drive consistent implementation for access control based on those search parameters. But this also provides us a very general language so that as new use cases come online, we don't have to invent new syntax but we can simply use this existing search parameter syntax uh, to be more expressive. So that's a very quick preview of what's coming in terms of structured or granular scopes for SMART version two. And that work is happening in conjunction uh, with the Argonaut project, which I mentioned earlier. So that's a signal of adoption and this virtuous cycle between vendors helping to make the specifications better uh, and then regulators taking the best of what's working and deploying them. So what I'd like to do next is share with you some of the tools and services that we make available through the Smart Health IT project for the community to use uh, to give you a sense of how you can get started building apps on your own uh, and some of the libraries that are out there um, to help you get started faster. So first is the Smart uh, App Gallery, which is a public site where anybody who has built an app can come and list it uh, and share the details of that app with the world. 
Um, this is meant to be a place where it's easy to share what you've built and it's vendor neutral and license neutral. So anybody who's built a smart on fire compatible app can come and list it here uh, with no cost. And I'll try to do just a very quick demo of the gallery, but it's hosted at apps at smarthealthit.org. Um, and by default, it shows you a set of apps in different categories. Uh, and we can drill in, and I'll just show you an example of a, a growth chart application that we built at Boston Children's Hospital as an open source demo application. But of course, the gallery itself is not limited to open source apps, and there's commercial apps and, and academic and research apps uh, and many different kinds of tools here. But just to give you a quick sense of how the gallery works, as a developer, you can list your app with a description, screenshots, or videos. Um, and then my favorite feature is this button at the top here that says, try it. And this allows users to get a sense of what your app is and, and how it works by running it in the context of a sandbox database with some synthetic patient records that are just freely available. Um, so in the case of this growth chart app, we've launched it directly from the Smart App Gallery. It connects to our sandbox server and fetches um, clinical history for a patient, which in this case consists of historical height and weight values drawn on this curve. Uh, so the gallery itself provides access to, uh, to users who want to give your app a spin if you want to enable that capability. And then the other really interesting feature is that if these apps are available inside of the major commercial EHR systems, we provide links to those commercial EHR systems directly inside of the gallery. I'm getting a page not found error, but any app developer can provide these links to where their app is listed inside of each vendor's system. Uh, and so this allows users to browse for apps that are going to work with the version of Fire that's in their system and allows you to see how broad the support is um, for these different uh, applications across a diverse set of EHR systems. That's a very quick tour of the Smart App Gallery. Uh, I want to share a couple of forward pointers or references to some other projects that are sort of in the Smart ecosystem. Uh, and CDS Hooks uh, shares a common lineage with Smart. It's a project that uh, I helped start when I was at Boston Children's Hospital working on Smart. Uh, and this is a specification that helps provide better workflow support for services that need to provide guidance in the context of an EHR session, but where you don't necessarily want um, the clinician to go and run an app every time. So CDS Hooks is a way to provide uh, that kind of information directly in the context of a workflow. And if you need to, CDS Hooks can provide a one-click access to launch relevant applications. So users don't have to search through a menu of potentially hundreds of apps uh, if there's only a few that are relevant in a given case. So this is a specification you can learn more about here at DevDays. Similarly, um, Smart Web Messaging is a specification that we're taking through the HL7 ballot process. Uh, we, we went through that voting and ballot process in September of this year. We're on the way to our 1.0 release. But the idea of web messaging is to allow Smart on Fire apps to communicate back and forth with the EHR um, without having to actually write uh, Fire data into a database somewhere. And, and then one other quick forward pointer is to the Smart on Fire bulk data project. And this is a, a specification that provides access to data at scale to entire populations of patients that enable access for things like um, shared risk pooling between clinical data and healthcare financial data, uh, allows you to get data for uh, training machine learning algorithms within the context of clinical histories, uh, and really provides that sort of population level core capability. And this is another topic that you can get more information about um, here at DevDays. Sync for Science is a project that is close to my heart, using the Smart on Fire specifications to help individual patients share their own data with research. Uh, and it's a specification that's been funded by the, the US government to help support uh, many different US-based research studies that could benefit from this kind of clinical data sharing, rather than having to build a network of research hospitals site by site, Sync for Science puts that control in the hands of individual consumers so they can make the choice about which clinical data they want to share with which research studies. Again, just based on this Smart on Fire app launch protocol. So that's a bit about adoption and some related projects. Let me switch gears now and show you some of the tools that we've got for the community that can help you build an app more quickly. Um, and one of the key resources is what we call a Smart App Launcher. And I'll show you a very quick demo of this. Uh, at first, this can be a little bit of an intimidating tool because it exposes a lot of the core capabilities of SMART for developers to test with uh, in a lightweight fashion. Uh, but I'll just show you a couple of details about how this launcher works. Uh, first of all, it provides the ability to test against different versions of the Fire specification, so released versions. Uh, we generally focus on Fire R4, which is the current version. 
And then in this column here, it provides access to launch apps of different types. Um, so we talked about a standalone launch and an EHR launch as the, the two main launch types that Smart supports. And so you can test each of those independently here uh, in the Smart Launcher. You can say, I want to test an EHR launch, or I want to test uh, a patient standalone launch. Uh, and then once you do that, you can select more details. So let's say, I want to test the patient standalone launch, and I want to figure out, well, which patient among the sandbox of sample patients here do I want to test with? And you can go and look through that sandbox and find a patient that sort of matches your requirements. And then once you've selected that patient, uh, it gets built into the launcher so that when you go to test your app, that patient will be pre-selected for you. And so a couple things happen when I choose a launch type and when I choose a patient from that list. Uh, first of all, the URL of the launcher is updated every time I make uh, any selection within these check boxes. And so this URL becomes something I can copy and share with a colleague or keep in my own notes file for later. Um, you can also access it just by clicking the save button here. And that completely encapsulates the state of what's going on in the launcher. So I can close this window and come back later and paste in that URL and I'll be right back where I was with patient standalone launch and this patient selected. So it allows kind of a stateless use here. And then as an app developer, once you've configured everything the way you want it, you get your own individualized fire server URL. Um, and this is really just a little shim that sits on top of one fire server, but it gives you the abstraction of having a fire server that's configured exactly to your needs. Um, and under the hood, all those configuration details are just sort of embedded in this one path segment. But you can then take this fire uh, server URL and put it into your app and basically tell your app, this is the fire server I want to connect to. Uh, so let's see what that looks like. Um, in real life with a demo. Uh, I've got links in the slide deck to a platform called glitch.com, which is just um, a free and easy to use code editing tool that comes with its own built-in web hosting. Um, and their links here include access to the underlying code and then an example using the smart standalone launch. So if we go and follow that example link, uh, we'll see that first of all, it sends me over to the smart launcher to quote unquote sign in. And this uses sort of a, a fake patient account. Um, all these accounts are just um, GUIDs as the usernames, and you can put in any password Excuse you want. Me. Yeah, yeah, hi, is this is a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, uh, we are not able to copy those URLs. Like, it's going to be faster. Not sure if that document is available for us after the call. Yeah, yeah of course. The slide, deck, to... yeah, the slide deck with all the links that I'm sharing is, uh, is available. I, I pasted a link into the chat here. Uh, so you can follow okay. that link from the chat and then the slide deck itself incorporates all the links that I'm clicking on. So I, 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 my apologies, I don't expect people to be able to, to jot down these URLs as I'm clicking through them. Uh, th thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Good. So in this patient portal then, um, you sign in using any password you like. It's not, it's not a real account, uh, but it takes you through this workflow of approving an app. And if I say, yes, I approve access to this uh, set of data, then this little app can fetch a few uh, hemoglobin A1C lab values from the EHR and make a little plot. Uh, and I won't go into the details of what's involved in uh, you know, coding up this app, but I will take you on a very quick tour um, just so you can get a sense of how much or how little code is involved in building an app like this. Uh, so the standalone launch is kicked off from this web page here called standalone.html. And it's really just um, includes one script, which is our open source smart on fire client library. And then it makes one call to get authorized against a particular EHR fire endpoint. Uh, and of course, this fire endpoint happens to be one of our smart launcher endpoints, but this could also be um, one of the major EHR vendor sandboxes or any other valid fire endpoint. And then once the app itself has completed launch and it's been authorized, we call this um, fire.oauth2.ready function, which is gonna give us uh, basically a client library object which we can use to issue fire API queries. And I won't go through the details of them, but this is a simple query that just searches for all observations associated with the patient uh, in context, and then filters down based on a specific link code, sorts them by date, and asks for the most recent 10 of those uh, hemoglobin A1C observations. And then it takes them and, and extracts the date and the value and puts them into a charting library to make that plot that you saw. And again, the details are not critical here, but I just want to give you a sense that about 25 lines of JavaScript and HTML, you can get a functioning app. Uh, and the example there that, that you can use from the glitch.com platform is something you can take and fork and start to tweak with to experiment with uh, how you build an app. 
zooming out a little bit, there's a number of open source libraries and tools that are available uh, for many platforms of development. So the Smart Health IT team makes these JavaScript and HTML uh, libraries available, but there's other libraries, including libraries in iOS, Java, Python, .NET, Ruby, um, that are maintained by the community and that can help you get a quick start when you're building Smart on Fire apps uh, and you wanna quickly go through the OAuth process. And then once you've got an access token, use that access token to fetch clinical data. Hey, Jack, this is Gershon. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So, in the sample code you are showing, right? You didn't show me the, like, I, at least I didn't see the authorization thing, how you are doing the authorization. Just with the URL, uh, anybody can do it, but uh, each fire server is going to have the authorization, right? So, how yeah, are we so, doing that? So, in the, in the sample code, this, this, this API call here is it was what manages the authorization request. Uh, and of course, there's a library that is going through the steps of the OAuth process. Um, based on this request, but so for each EHR, server, we'd be having an authorization token. So yeah, we'd be having an authorization token for each fire server. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk through app registration. Um, so that each each EHR that you want to connect with is an EHR that your app needs to be registered with um, before it can connect. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those vendor sandbox environments in, in a moment. Um, so so thank okay. you for the reminder. We'll, we'll come right back to that. Okay. Um, I want to say a couple of words about open source. Uh, apps, which we make available to the community. Uh, these are available in the Smart Health IT GitHub, and they're also linked from, um, from the Smart Health IT gallery. Um, so there's a checkbox for open source apps if you want to explore uh, some richer or more dynamic examples of where these kinds of apps have been built uh, to implement clinical risk scores um, or other validated kinds of instruments. Um, sandboxes. So, so thank you for the, the heads up on that front. Uh, there's a number of places where you can test your apps as you're building them uh, and before you roll them into real world production. I've shown you the smart sandbox already as part of that launcher example, but you can go to fire.epic.com or open.epic.com. Uh, you can go to code.cerner.com. All scripts has a sandbox for, uh, for EH, uh, EHR based applications. Uh, and each of these uh, major commercial EHR vendors with support for the Smart on Fire API will have its own app registration process where you can um, connect the details of your app. Uh, critically, you let those EHR vendors know the URLs where your app is hosted. So that way, as you go through the OAuth process, they can make sure that the what's called the redirect URL that they send users to matches that redirect URL that you've pre-registered with them ahead of time. And that's a really important step because in real world OAuth deployments, that protects end users from being sent up to potentially a malicious site um, because they can be sure that the URL they're being redirected to has been pre-registered with the EHR. Uh, that helps improve the level of trust uh, with those redirections. Uh, in the context of the US, the story is actually gonna be much broader than this slide suggests because every certified EHR vendor in the United States will need to have support for registering these apps and connecting using the Smart on Fire protocols within effectively the next two years. So we'll be talking about what's, what's dozens or hundreds of different EHR vendors that offer support for this kind of app registration. Um, I've shown you examples from, our, from one sandbox, which is the Smart Sandbox. It comes really from two sources. By numbers, most patients in the Smart Sandbox come from the Cynthia uh, Synthetic Data Generation Project but we also have a small number of patients that come from sort of de-identified longitudinal medical records. Uh, and there's a mix of these patients in the sandbox because depending on what type of app uh, you're testing uh, or what type of clinical sample data you need access to, there may be different patients with different clinical features that are gonna best show off um, your application. I've given you this tour uh, through the Smart App Launcher. I wanna close with um, a few notes about our documentation site overall. And this is probably the best single link that I would point to in terms of getting started with Smart Health IT. This lives at docs.smarthealthit.org. Uh, and on this site, we provide access to the foundational standards. So these include FHIR and CDS hooks, uh, but also to what are called data access profiles. And I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about what has been the most important set of data access profiles in the US. Um, so there's places to learn more about US core profiles. Um, and this is a US centric example, but this same kind of work is happening at international levels as part of the international uh, patient um, summary and international patient access specification work. But I'll show you this example from the US because it's probably the farthest along um, in terms of maturity and profile development. 
The idea here is that within a given uh, region of the world, within a given jurisdiction, there are some things that we can agree on very easily that might be harder to get worldwide agreement on. And in general, as we're building the fire specification and as we're building national profiles or even regional profiles, the game is always to find as much consensus or as much agreement as you can within your group. And if you can't get to agreement, then you can create a smaller group of, of people who are more aligned on use cases. So the FHIR US core profiles provide that at the level of basic data access in the US. For each of the FHIR resource types that you see listed here, there is a FHIR profile that digs into the details of how those, um, those FHIR resources can be used in the context of US-based data exchange. And I'll show you an example just to give you a, an intuition for what's involved here. Uh, and this is the profile for the immunization resource. And so what we say in the context of immunizations is first of all, every immunization needs to have a status and a vaccine code and a date when the vaccine was administered as well as a patient. And it must support um, a status reason, which is to say if the vaccination wasn't given, uh, why is it not given? Um, now that those might seem like things that you would expect all fire immunizations to support, uh, but in practice, that's not the case. Um, in practice, the base fire specification allows some of these things to be missing. In the context of the US core profile, we can set them to be required. So that's one thing that a profile can do is to move specific data elements from optional and turn them into required elements uh, or turn them into must support elements. And the second really important thing that happens in these profiles is what we call vocabulary binding. So in the US, we can get widespread agreement that every vaccination record should include uh, a code that comes from this particular code system, uh, which is the CBX uh, code system, uh, and that is published here in FHIR, which is a set of vaccine codes that comes from the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So that's just an example of one resource that we've profiled in the US core. But the idea is to elevate this level of interoperability by getting agreement on things like code systems and required data elements that we could administer quite broadly within the context of US-based healthcare. Um, also included in our docs overview site are links to uh, some best practice advice on the security front, as well as tutorials, uh, both tutorials that we produce um, from the Smart Health IT group, as well as from the various EHR vendors. So for example, uh, I'd certainly recommend Cerner's tutorial for building browser-based apps. It's quite a thorough example uh, from getting started to building a full-on HTML and JavaScript app. Um, and we also include links to those various software libraries that I mentioned uh, in the slide deck earlier. All of the testing tools, the launcher, uh, our sandbox services, as well as specific EHR vendor services, um, like the Epic, Cerner, and Allscripts sandboxes that I mentioned are linked to from here as well as the synthetic data generation tools. Um, and then finally, the open source apps that I, uh, that I talked through a little bit, including the growth chart app that I showed a demo of are linked here from sample apps. There's good links to support forums. Um, there's a Google discussion group, as well as the chat.fire.org Zulip uh, chat, where there's a smart stream that's quite uh, active and probably the best place to bring initial questions. And then some links to specifications that are works in progress or sort of bleeding edge. Um, and with that, what I'd like to do is pause and open up for questions. Happy to dig into any of the technical or deployment aspects uh, of these specifications. Um, and, and I'll also monitor, uh, with some help from Frank, the Q&A section on Whova. So as, as folks get ready to unmute and ask questions, let me try to do one from Whova, which is a question about Smart Scopes V2. And the question is, for Smart Scopes V2, why have you chosen a higher level of abstraction than the fire interaction or operation. Um, and so I think the, the question that, uh, that Donald's asking here gets back to, let me see if I can just open up the right link. Uh, when I was showing you the preview of the work that we're doing in Smart Scopes V2, um, I think that the question is sort of why don't we make, in, instead of using scopes like this, why don't we just like literally have one specific API call here um, and and bind it down to the details of that specific call rather than describing this sort of set of data elements. And I think that the short answer is it's, it's meant to be a balancing act. Um, these things map pretty closely to individual fire interactions, uh, but oftentimes we wanna to group together a set of interactions like read and search to be able to create these policies um, at the level that would cover more than one API call. 
a common theme has been how large these scopes can get over the wire. Um, we have uh, some detailed guidance for keeping those scopes smaller as well. Um, if there's follow-ups, um, it might actually be better to dig in on the, the smart chat rather than to go super deep on this topic here, because as I mentioned, it is kind of work in progress. And I, I just wanted to give folks a preview uh, to show where that work is coming. Um, if there's questions on audio, I'm happy to take those. Otherwise, I'll keep working through the Q&A on Hoover. So, all right. On Whova, there's one that asks, how do you know if a hospital is compliant with Smart on Fire, uh, i.e., is this currently only implemented in the US? Um, there's a few ways to answer this. In, in short, you know, right now, this is, as far as widespread deployment, um, US is where I have seen um, the broadest deployment. But the answer to, is any given hospital compliant, um, might often come, might, might, easiest, might be easiest to find from an EHR vendor rather than from the hospital. There's some mix. Uh, if you look at the final rules that our Office of the National Coordinator published this year, one of the requirements is that each vendor needs to be able to publish a list of all the fire endpoints that their customers, meaning uh, hospitals and healthcare systems use. So for example, um, Epic hosts this uh, web page here, as well as a JSON file that has all the same data that lists, you know, maybe four or 500 organizations that all have uh, turned on these API access endpoints within Epic systems. And they also do it by fire version. So some of these are released with the fire DSTU2 specification. Some of these have fire R4 support turned on, uh, and you can go and get that kind of list from vendors. And we'll see more of this. We'll see each certified vendor publishing that kind of support list uh, on the vendor specific websites. My guess is that hospitals will do this too, but it might be more difficult to get that information in a uniform place than it is from the vendors who are required to publish it and make it public uh, and discoverable. Let me, let me pause and see if there's other questions on audio. Otherwise, I'll keep moving down the Whova questions. So the next one is, uh, do EMRs like Epic and Cerner support smart apps in the UK and Canada? And do these vendors charge to publish a smart app? So first of all, the question of charges is a, is a really important one. Um, and the, the easy answer is it depends. Historically, it's been a little bit challenging to understand the pricing models um, for connecting apps to these EHRs. In the US at least, we now uh, will have a much more straightforward framework for pricing. Um, first of all, for patient access, these APIs need to be free of charge, which means that um, for accessing the, what's called the US core data set, those profiles that I showed you earlier, um, app developers need to be able to register apps and patients need to be able to share their data with these apps without any charge to the app developers or to the patients. So those use cases are effectively free. And for, other apps, including clinician facing apps, there could be fees associated with access, but those fees need to be sort of published and they need to be assessed equally uh, rather than charging different fees for different kinds of apps or different uh, fees that are tied to different app development business models. So the idea here is there would sort of be reasonable and, and sort of non-discriminating pricing that's tied to the number of API calls you make rather than being tied to the business value that you're generating. Uh, so the idea is to think about these APIs as more of a utility. Um, that's the context in which API access is rolling out in the US. And I can't actually speak to whether these uh, same APIs are available today in the UK and Canada. I haven't heard about it, but that, that shouldn't be taken as definitive. Was that from ONC driving that? Yeah, those, those expectations about pricing come from a set of requirements um, that ONC published, some of which have to do with um, a set of information blocking provisions, so basically defining uh, the exceptions to information blocking, some of which are baked into what they call conditions of certification, so sort of practices that a company needs to follow in order to have a certified product. And some of them are built into the certification rules themselves, so like each, each product needs to show that it works in a certain way. That's sort of the toolkit that ONC has available for, for defining and enforcing those rules. Cool, thanks. Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, another question on Whova. Will you also standardize scopes for sensitive or break the glass type of scenarios? Um, this is a complicated question. 
overall, um, the, the scopes that we define in SMART generally have to do with delegation. And so we don't try to say what any given user is allowed to do or see, but we try to say, given what that user can do, what permissions do they want to share with a specific application? Uh, and so the scopes that we define in SMART have to do with um, sort of intersection logic. As a user, I can do these things and I choose to share this subset of my capabilities with a specific application. Um, break the glass tends to be uh, a concept that's used in the context of um, safety critical clinical data access where an application um, effectively can vouch for itself and get access to data um, or where an individual can authorize the app to get access to a broader set of data than it otherwise would. So we don't say anything specific about those kinds of scenarios in the, the smart delegation scopes, but those kinds of capabilities can be layered on top of sort of smart data sharing. Um, I'll take the next question then on Whova, which is, are there any open source authentication and authorization servers and proxies that can help kickstart new projects? And from the nature of the question, I, I think this is a question about um, kickstarting new projects to host a Smart on Fire server uh, rather than new projects for, for client app development. Um, there's a number of, of tools and services out there that can help. Uh, there's been very strong community interest recently in using uh, Keycloak, which is a, a Java language based open source, um, highly configurable OAuth and OpenID Connect server. So there's a pretty strong interest group that's been forming. Um, I would say check out uh, chat.fire.org and search for Keycloak as probably the, the area that has the most widespread support and interest today. Um, but there's a few other tools and services out there, um, including both open source um, as well as commercial services, things like Okta, um, things like Auth0 that can be configured. Uh, and I, I think that you'll see more and more of these services offered in kind of a bundled way on top of cloud hosted fire servers, so that if you're spinning up a fire server uh, within a given cloud environment, it should be uh, easier to turn on these kinds of access controls. Um, next question from Huba, is there a timeline on which the big EHR vendors like Epic or Cerner will support smart access for standalone apps in real hospital ecosystems? Uh, yes, and hopefully I spoke to this at least briefly from this timeline slide that comes from the ONC. Um, one thing that I'll note is that these timelines ha have slipped just recently owing to COVID-19. And so a set of enforcement dates that were initially gonna be in the middle of the year in 2021 um, have effectively been delayed by six months uh, so that there's an extra six months or an extra half year of time for the vendors to get the software written and certified and also to roll it out in production for customers. But effectively, if we look at the dates on this slide, the, the sort of framework to have in mind is a set of compliance dates that will be happening um, in the middle of next year. And then a set of a deployment for the APIs themselves that should happen sort of by the end of next calendar year. Um, it's been a little bit of a moving target, but that's where things have stabilized today. We've got two minutes left. Um, let me see if I can answer at least one more question. Uh, here's one that says, please discuss how SMART handles patient consents. Um, oh, and then a correction, how does SMART handle patient consents? Okay. Um, the short answer is we don't generally think of SMART as handling patient consents. Uh, we think about SMART, when, when a patient is using SMART, we think about this as uh, an individual exercising their right to access their own data and to share with a third party. Uh, and so in the context of HIPAA, for example, there's one concept that, that HIPAA in the US calls authorization, uh, which is a patient saying to a health system, I allow you to share my data with this third party. And that's a little bit of a limited concept because it's just saying, I allow you. The health system can choose to or choose not to sort of then act on that authorization. So it's not so much the right concept for sharing data with apps. The words can get confusing here because the same words are used in a legal sense and in a technical sense, and they have different meanings. But the way that I, th I, I think it's helpful to look at this from a patient perspective is SMART gives you the explicit ability to approve access to a third-party app. So when you tell 
uh, when you click that button that says, yes, I approve, I want to share my data with this app, that is registering what is considered a patient access request. And it comes along with the details of who you are and what data you're sharing. You're doing it based on a patient portal account you already have. So there's no need to sort of guess about your identity or try to match it to an existing database. You've got a relationship with this healthcare provider and you're explicitly saying, yes, I wanna share this set of my data with an app of my choice. So I, I hope that helps and I'm happy to talk more about that offline as well. I know that terminology can be confusing. Uh, with that, I think we're at time. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, I hope that you've, you've learned something about where these APIs can fit in and, and how you could start developing apps that plug into these clinical systems in the real world. I'm going to be doing a uh, fireside chat later this week. So if there's follow-ups, please don't hesitate to join there and we can continue to dig in. Um, and with that, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you very you much, uh, Thank Josh. you for the interesting talk. Great talk. Thanks a lot. Take care.